Hello, this is Dr. C, and welcome to another lecture, as well as the uh, audio version of the podcast as well. So this, these lectures are identical in terms of what's loaded to my podcast channel as well as my uh, YouTube channel. And you can search for them just using the same title, Psychology Concepts Explained. You can find both the uh, using a podcasting, audio podcasting app, or search on YouTube for these videos. Okay, so today we're going to focus on the chapter on memory. So depending on the textbook you have, the chapter number might be different, but I'm using uh, an outline PowerPoint slide from uh, OpenStax, that's O-P-E-N-S-T-A-X dot org, and they have a collection of free textbooks that are available, and this is from the Psychology 2nd Edition. All right, so we're going to focus on memory, how it works, some of the basic theoretical foundations of how our memory works, and you're going to uh, be f thinking about how some of these theories relate to cognitive psychology. Okay, Cognitive psychologists focus on our thought processes, how we process information, so uh, it's directly related to what we're talking about here today. Um, in some of your memory uh, chapters, and depending on the textbook you have, it may talk a lot about the biological foundations of memory, so that would be more in the territory of a neuropsychology or um, neuropsychologist or neuro, uh, psycho, sorry, biopsychology. All right, so I am uh, recording today from uh, State Park in Texas, so you're going to hear sounds from the outdoors. Okay, so here are the main ideas we're going to cover today. How is it that we process and store information? What kinds of memories are there? And how do we get them back? How do we retrieve them? And why is it sometimes we feel like we're forgetting things? Okay. For example, being at a, a social function, you meet someone, you introduce yourself, they tell them your name, and then it seems like a split second later, the name is gone from your head, right? It's like in one ear, out the other. So we'll try to figure out why that is, okay? And assuming that you're not stone drunk at the time. <laughs> okay, so in terms of how memory functions, let's talk about some basic terminologies. And these terminologies are borrowed from computer science. So with the advent of the computer and in terms of using the vocabulary of describing how a computer functions, or any kind of our our smart devices these days, that it seems like a good analogy to describe and explain how information is um, moved around, stored within our brain as well. So let's focus on the first term: is encoding, right? So encoding is how we put information into memory. Okay? So if you're using a computer, encoding would be using the keyboard or using and whatever accessibility function, maybe using your voice, right? You have, to, you have to use a method to transfer information that's going on in your head uh, into the computer system to be stored. That's called encoding. And storage is retaining information, okay? Um, so in your computer, that would be the hard drive, okay? Um, on your cell phone, right? Whether you have 64 gigabytes or 128 gigabytes in your iPad, right, whichever. That is called storage. So our brain also has storage of information about our experiences and things we learned throughout our lives. And then the third process is retrieval. So we've encoded information, we've stored it, and now at some point we need to retrieve it. So this basically for you students out there, this is your mission in college, isn't it? Every time you take a class, you have to pay attention, you have to encode as much information you can into your brain. And then during a test, you have to try to retrieve that information. So the very last thing we'll talk about in this lecture is how to improve your memory, how to, in terms of uh, being, in, being a student, being an academic, how do you improve your school performance? So I think there's a lot of uh, applicability here in terms of uh, what, how we can use this information for our own improvement. Let's focus on encoding and what happens when we um, learn something new. So to encode anything, we have to use our senses, right? 
We have to see it with our eyes, hear it. Uh, we have memories of smells too. So we smell things, we taste things, right? So, and we touch things. So all of those things are different types of memories that we can actually encode, right? And oftentimes we need to label what that is, right? In our mind, we take that new information, organize it, maybe group it with something else so we can relate to it better. Um, we can connect a new concept that we're learning. Maybe you're learning sociology and you see how it relates to the field of psychology. So you connect new concepts to existing concepts. These are things that we do in our mind to help us remember information. And when we're encoding information, sometimes it feels automatic, quick, right? And that's called automatic processing. And that's uh, where you are able to encode something without too much conscious awareness, okay? Um, whereas effortful processing takes a lot more conscious effort to actually encode a piece of information in, okay? So learning how to drive a car is a good example, where at the very beginning as a student learning how to drive, every little thing seemed like it took a lot of effort, right? So that's a lot of effortful processing, looking at the mirror, um, watching your speed, and then later on you become a more accomplished driver and you're driving with one hand while e eating a hamburger and listening to music. All the things you really shouldn't be doing, but you do anyway because it's second nature. You can use all of your conscious effort to observe traffic. You don't have to think about the mechanics of driving a vehicle. All right, so there are different levels of how we can input information and actually how we can get information out um, depending on how uh, whether or not something takes a little bit more effort or it's become second nature okay so the, the act of driving is from one level to the other level starts effortful ends up being automatic right and also the type of information we encode some of the information we encode has to do with language, encoding of words, vocabulary, and their meanings, and that's called semantic encoding. And we'll look at this term later on. There's such a thing as semantic memory. And also, we're, for those of you who think you're a visual learner, okay, we also encode images, right? And we encode sounds. So we have visual encoding, acoustic encoding, right? So we have uh, different kinds kinds of encoding depending on the senses with our, that we're using things that we see things that we hear and then also vocabulary related and also there's an interesting effect in research they found that if there's information that we can relate to or somehow it relates to us we have a little bit better recall than if information that is less personalized so I think when you're studying in any particular class um, you should think, what does this have to do with me, right? And the more that you can do that, then the more likely that information will stick. All right, here's a very well-known well model, uh, a construct to help us make sense of our memory, okay? And we're going to look at these very various uh, stages. And this is called the atkinson schifrin model of memory. You can also call it the three-stage model. So first of all, um, we said before that everything that we remember we have to first notice with our senses, right? So if you don't see it, you don't hear it, you don't touch it, whatever, then obviously you're not going to remember whatever stimulus that is, right? So the first stage of memory is called sensory memory. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And when our senses pick up that piece of information, for example, something you saw on the news, you have to do something with it. You have to move it to short-term memory. And I know these terms, short-term and long-term memory, you've seen a lot in various movies, for example. But a lot of times they're misrepresented. In other words, they don't correspond to this particular model. So we're going to talk a lot about short-term memory and how it's different than what most people think is short-term memory. For example, if it's lunchtime now and, and I ask you what you had for breakfast and you have a memory of that, and you tell me, that is not short-term memory just because it happened the same day, right? That is part of your long-term memory. So we pick up a piece of information from our senses, we call that sensory memory, we move it to short-term memory, then we have to actively move it to long-term memory. Once, the, once it is in long-term memory, it's like a file that's saved on your computer, it's gonna be there, 
right? Um, it's not just gonna fade away really quickly. All right. Now, one thing we need to do to, to uh, and we'll talk about this in terms of what are the techniques that we can use to make this process more efficient for us. So if you have a tendency to forget things, then think of these three stages, sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory. Something is being uh, slipped through, okay? All right, let's talk about sensory memory first. Again, this is a brief storage of our sensory events, sights, sounds, and tastes, okay? And literally what this means is the image that's held in your retina, right? The imprint of someone's hand when they grab you and then they let go when you see that on your skin, right? So sensory memory really is just a split second, or maybe up to one to two seconds of time, right? So you're, you're absorbing something from the environment. Like right now I'm hearing an airplane going by, uh, right? And so, yeah, there it is, it's a small airplane. Um, the fact that I can recognize that sound as an airplane is because First, I notice the sound, right? And at some point before I've ever heard of an airplane, I would notice that sound, I would take a look at it, I would have to process it, make sense of it, and then remember it, store it as, and maybe use, my, use visual memory as well, as like, okay, that shape and sound is a, is a small aircraft, okay? And now I have recognition of that. So we have to process this stimuli from our environment, okay? You can't just sit there like a zombie and, and in that old phrase, you know, an instructor will spoon feed information to you. It doesn't work that way. To remember anything, it has to be a very active process, not a passive process. So just because you're in the classroom and someone's speaking doesn't mean that information will get into your head. You have to actually do a lot with that information for you to remember it. So let's go back to that social gathering and why a person might... Um, not remember a name first of all think about sensory memory perhaps a person didn't hear it right um, and even if a person did hear it then okay that piece of information was in their ear canal right the sound was there but then maybe in step two stage two the information was lost okay so hey another aircraft All right, was there a Doppler effect in your headphones with that one? I'm not sure if I'm recording in, st in stereo. All right, so once we hold on to this, okay, that's why stu uh, teachers in elementary school are always yelling at students to pay attention. What they're really saying is, look, hear, listen, right? Because the moment you're distracted and your eyes and ears are somewhere else, whoever's talking to you, whatever that information there, you kind of hear sounds, but it may as well be blah, 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 right? Because it, the words don't get into your into your senses and then transferred on to the next stage of memory, which is short-term memory. All right, now, this is the key here. Short-term memory, those of you who understand computers, think of this as RAM memory, random access memory, okay? So what happens is, is that when your computer is using RAM memory, for example, you're watching a YouTube video, you're... Um, opening up five documents, right? Unless you have autosave or you click save on those files, if your computer shuts off, the information's gone, right? It was, it did not make it into permanent storage, and that's what short-term memory is. I think this is the um, let's mess with Doctor C uh, aircraft show. All right, so. Our brain's working memory, I'm sorry, that wasn't me, okay, that was the airplane. Our brain's working memory lasts around 20 seconds. What that means is that we hear a name, okay, let's go back to the social situation. Someone tells them your name, uh, their name, unless, and then you hear it, right? Now you're thinking about it. If you do nothing else with that, it will literally fade in 20 seconds, okay? So what we can do to hold on to it is to rehearse it. Rehearsal is the repetition of that information. So you may say that over and over again in your head. It's kind of like if someone told you a phone number while you're talking to them on the phone. Say, hey, remember this number, okay? It's 817, blah, 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 okay? Well, and then they hang up. And you're racing to find a piece of pen and paper. Why? Because you, you inherently know that unless you write it down, 
that that piece of information is going to fade right in your brain so we repeat it over and over again that's called maintenance rehearsal now you may use this technique when you're studying right you ever use that you you take some notes you have some definitions and you're walk pacing back and forth in your in your dorm room or apartment and reading the definition over and over again and then the next day you take a test and you remember it but that is actually an inefficient way to study and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later okay all right so our short-term memory can only store a very limited amount of information for a very short period of time so it's no wonder we forget things right or not be able to remember things because it really requires a conscious effort to move a piece of information from short-term memory into long-term memory okay it does require some effort so short-term memory is very temporary it's not about what you ate for breakfast that morning it's about what your mind is thinking about right now okay just like your computer what files are open right now right and once you close them they're gone okay unless you click save and that is the process we need to learn with our brains is how do we click save to a new piece of information for example how do I remember the image of that airplane right that just went by and I looked at it for three seconds okay, I had to do something with it actively you know if I just glanced at it and went about my business I will definitely not remember that particular image okay so we have to do something we have to transfer this information to short-term memory okay I'm gonna demonstrate this by giving you a short-term memory test I'm gonna call out a series of numbers let's see one two three I have about five numbers here the first number is gonna be four digits long the last number is gonna be okay, I'm not gonna tell you but we're gonna keep going okay probably nine digits long or so and I want you to write down this number only after I called out the last digit of each number okay so don't cheat so if I say one two three four you don't just start writing one two three and four then the moment I say one two three or four you wait until I say four then I say okay then you start writing it okay this is a short-term memory test so let's start with the first number two one five six okay write it down pretty easy right so unless someone was yelling at you from another room at that particular moment and interfered with your attention you probably got that and I'll show these numbers in the next slide okay okay the next number pay attention five three nine five one okay let's go to the next one five zero three one seven zero okay you got that right okay next number six four two seven seven zero four okay write it down and this is the last one okay so pay real good attention hope I'm not hurting, hurting your brain ready zero three six four eight nine one three okay write it down okay so one two three four I have five numbers I gave you let's see how well you did oh here they are so I'll let you look at that for a while you can pause it while you look at it correct your uh, let's see where you went wrong all right so we have a four digit number five digit number six seven and then an eight digit number okay so one of these was my is my phone number okay without the area code all right so I just gave that out so you notice that um, there was a reason why I called out those numbers in that way it was kind of annoying right you want them you want to hear it quickly and there's a reason why on radio commercials phone numbers are not read to you that way because the reason I paused was that I wanted to separate each number as one bit of information so if we go back to the previous slide right the capacity of our short-term memory is usually about seven items and if you want to think about computers that's only seven bits of information plus or minus two okay that's the usual range for most people okay so the reason I, I slowed down 
was so that each digit represents okay represents one unit of information or one bit of information so most of you on average might get the seven digit number or you may range between seven and nine which I didn't get to okay? and that's pretty common now what if a phone number look like look like that 713-888-1989 okay, don't call it I have no idea whose number that is right now the reason that might be easier is because if you're familiar with area codes in your local area you may not need to remember the 713 right that's sort of second agent you may shorthand it write a 7 888 you can group that together right that's three number group okay that's easy to remember 888 and then the last four digits resembles a year okay so the fact that you're able to do these mental tricks and group numbers together allows you to um, remember more digits so this in a sense is maybe only three three units of information an area code a three-digit number and then a year right so that doesn't quite go up to the average of seven okay digits of uh, units of information so that's how we can understand someone who's speaking fast right because we take in whole chunks of information at a time we're not processing each letter or each syllable when someone's speaking to us otherwise, otherwise right now I may be speaking too quickly for you okay so again this is a demonstration of short-term memory and it only lasts for 20 seconds until we do something all right let's talk about long-term memory and there are different categories of long-term memory and what's interesting about our brain is that when you compare our brain to a computer, let's think about the device you're using right now, whether it's a phone or tablet or computer, right? There's RAM memory, okay? Right now, a typical number for a phone is four gigabytes. Okay, that's still a lot of units. That's a lot of bytes and bits, okay? Let's compare that to your brain. Seven, okay? Not seven gigabytes, seven bits. Our brains really suck, okay? So you can open up tons of documents, open up tons of videos at one time right your computer or phone can handle it but our brain right at one moment can only handle seven units of information so we have to be very very efficient with that now in terms of long-term storage right what does your phone have 64 GB gigabytes right maybe these days you can get a computer with one terabyte hard drive right this is long-term storage right what's stored there is stored there even when you turn your computer off or device off what about our brain? Here is where our brain is superior. No limitations, right? Even though it feels like sometimes our brain is full, no doctor has ever seen a patient who showed up at their clinic and said, doctor, I think, I think my brain is full. I've reached my maximum capacity. I cannot learn a new word, right? For a healthy functioning person, that's not gonna happen, okay? All right, so. Okay, somebody just walked by with their dog. Okay, I'm trying not to disturb other campers, but I have to keep going. All right, so in long-term memory, um, again, there's no limit, but let's talk about types of information that's stored there. All right, two categories. Explicit memories. Now, explicit doesn't mean like dirty stuff, okay? No, you watch too much TV. Then there's implicit memories, okay? Explicit another synonym for that is declarative what that means is that these this is information that um, we can recall right that that our words uh, or experiences okay or pieces of information like from Wikipedia that's our brains Wikipedia that's called explicit memory that we can sit there and answer a question out loud implicit memories um, are also called non-declarative. So think of declare as to say out loud. I'm giving you a memory tool right now. Non-declarative are memories that we have that we don't say out loud. These are more procedures and skills, or sometimes it's an emotional reaction to something. In other words, it doesn't take much effort for us to recall a piece of information. Okay. Now under declarative memory, 
experiences. Then there's another category of information called semantic knowledge, right? Semantics are concepts and words. This is our factual information. Like if I were to tell you that a season, a yearly pass for Texas State Parks is $70, right? It gives you unlimited daytime entry. That was me using my semantic knowledge. But for me telling you about my day and how it was difficult to record a, a lecture because of all the noise going on, that is an example of an episodic memory, okay? All right, so uh, I just talked about these examples, so we can go over this a little bit. We can skip over this a little bit. Let me, let me talk about the other category, implicit memories, right? These are also called non-declarative, if you remember, five seconds ago. Okay, so an implicit memory is a memory or action that we have. In other words, we kind of remember to do something that is not part of our conscious awareness. So most of our implicit memories are procedural things, meaning skills, like how to ride a bicycle, how to tie your shoelaces, how to drive a car, okay? And again, we mentioned this at the beginning of, the, of this lecture, driving a car. What feels like second nature now in other words, you don't really think about where something is located when you're acting, okay? So if you think about a tennis player, they're not really thinking about where their elbow is and how their fingers are gripping the ball when they toss a serve and their grip on the racket. That is all second nature. So their mental energy is spent on strategy. Where am I going to hit the ball? What position should I be in? Right? What is my opponent's weakness? But a beginning player, and I, and I remember taking tennis class in physical education. I remember, you know, just tossing the ball straight up for a serve was like the hardest thing. So it was like, you have to keep doing it over and over again. And some people call that muscle memory, right? So our procedural implicit memories are what you can think of as what people call muscle memory, all right? Okay, so let's keep moving on. Let's talk about retrieving information. That's called retrieval. So we've talked about encoding. We've talked about long-term memory storage. Let's talk about getting information out. Okay. And again, this is sort of like using your computer. How do you get information out? Well, you type in the name of a file, or maybe you print it. Okay. Uh, and that's how you can recall information. Now let's think about um, taking tests as a student. Right. There are different kinds of questions you're given, and it represents these different kinds of recall or retrieval techniques. One is called recall, okay? So a recall is is a way of recalling information without any hints or clues or what we can call cues, okay? No hints whatsoever. So an essay exam is almost like that. As long as the question is short, right? If you have a long essay question, you, you can use items in that question as a way to recall things. But, but the best kind of recall question would be, like, say, at a scene of a crime, an officer would just say, what did you see? Right? What happened? They wouldn't say things like, which way did they go? Right? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. How tall was he? Right? Those are leading kind of things that could interfere with memory. Okay, another type of re retrieval is called recognition. And uh, for most of you, I think, for some reason, you prefer this, right? In, in college, these are multiple choice exams or matching where all you need to do, the answers are right there. You just need to be able to identify something that you've learned. If you think about it, it's really kind of a sad thing, right? That professors are giving you exams with the answers on them. Okay? I know you may not have thought about it this way, but if I'm giving a test with 50 questions and all multiple choice, right? And assuming there's none of the, the choice never has none of the above, then I'm basically giving the answer to every question. Yikes. Okay, it's kind of depressing to think about it that way, especially if you do poorly on a test. But the idea here is that you just need to be able to recognize what that correct answer is. Okay? Now, relearning, some of you may have that as experience if you're bilingual, right? And let's say you haven't used one of the languages in a long time and you feel like, oh, it's so rusty, maybe it's gone forever. But yet you go into that environment where you hear that language and use that language and suddenly it just comes back, right? That's called relearning. And that, that's what happened to me with my Taiwanese and Mandarin dialects is that, you know, I, I left Taiwan at a young age and I only finished sixth grade, uh, seventh grade education there. 
So my Mandarin today is basically like talking to a seventh grader, right, with an adult age. Um, but a couple of years ago, we went back to Taiwan and lived for a couple of years, and wow, my language skills came back. And, and I was able to, of course, integrate new words as well. Okay, so let's review this real quick. So retrieval has to do with bringing energy out of long-term memory. Okay, so we can think about it. That's our short-term memory. Okay, um, and so encoding goes this direction where we hear or see something, we do something with it, manipulate that information in short-term memory, and we encode it into long-term memory. And then later on, we try to retrieve it. All right, let's talk about different ways that we might um, lose information, okay? Or, or have our memory affected. And one is amnesia. I know if you're a fan of K dramas um, or any kind of soap opera, amnesia is a, seems to appear in every episode, right? And, uh, but a lot of people also misunderstand that there are different kinds of amnesia. So let's look at these two types. And these are words that you may need to have a memory trick to remember because they sound very similar. All right, there's anterograde amnesia versus retrograde amnesia. And I think visually it's easier to write it down as a, as a graphic. So if you can see here, and if you, those of you who don't, who are listening and not seeing this outline, imagine the event is in the middle. You just write down the word event. And there's a timeline going to the right that's toward the present, right? Or the future. Anterograde amnesia means that after some sort of trauma or illness where the brain was affected, anterograde amnesia means that new information cannot cannot be remembered. Okay, they're stuck in a time 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 uh, freeze. Okay, so for example, if I had a brain damage in 1980, that means from anything after 1980, anything new, I won't be able to remember. But everything previous to that, I will. And procedural memories too so it's not as if someone would forget how to drive a car and those kind of things if those memories are already there and those skills then that person will have them but they will not be able to remember a new person's face or a new person's name for example okay? and that's called anterograde amnesia and oftentimes the part of the brain that's affected is the hippocampus the hippocampus is almost like a filter that helps us to f recall or encode new information Okay, so if that filter is broken, that means information can't get in. Okay, it's almost like having a broken keyboard. Actually, I have a MacBook Pro laptop that's 10 years old, and I can't type on it. Right? So in a sense, my, my computer has anterograde amnesia. Everything stored in there is still there, but since the keyboard is broken, I cannot add new information. <laughs> okay? So my computer has amnesia. Now, retrograde amnesia is the opposite. Let's say you know the person is 25 years old, they have an event, Everything, um, their loss of memory, not everything, okay, but it could be partial or complete for events that occurred prior to the trauma is lost. That's called retrograde amnesia, okay? Um, so remembering everything from high school or, you know, that kind of thing. So blocks of information may be gone. That's like going to a computer and deleting files, okay? So those are two types of amnesia. All right, now the next thing. Um, concept that has a lot to do with um, eyewitness testimony it helps us to understand how eyewitnesses and how they recall information works and that's the idea that our memory is constructed okay it's an active process right our brains are not like video recorders okay so I love these scenes in movies where you know you have an expert CIA agent and they they play this like sort of recall in their mind in slow-mo and they're able to zoom in and notice someone's hair color and face or something that's printed on a newspaper and you know I call BS on that because our memories do not work that way when we recall something we're actually reconstructing that memory okay we're piecing it back together so our brains are not perfect video and audio recording machines okay? we often fill in the blanks if we don't have um, perfect recall of that okay so this has a lot to do with eyewitnesses right because we're, we're relying on an eyewitness whether or not to put someone in prison and convict them and we hope that their testimony is accurate okay but what research has found is that our memories are highly suggestible 
anything. So if we get information, such as misinformation from other sources, it could create false memories. That's called the false memory syndrome. Okay, So our memories can be very fragile and vulnerable to the power of suggestion. Okay, So that's why an investigator or a lawyer has to be very careful about asking an eyewitness of a fresh of a fresh incident. If it just happened, you're the investigator first on the scene, then that witness must not be talking to people. They must not be talking to other witnesses. Right? They have to be isolated. And then you simply ask them, tell me what happened. Okay? Use as few words as possible in the question because the words in the question may influence the person's memory of that event because they're reconstructing it. Then if that suggested word goes in there like they then if they really just saw one perpetrator, they're thinking, oh, yeah, maybe there were two, right? And as hard as that is to believe, a person may feel highly confident about that, even though it's not a real memory, okay? And you see here in this next uh, graphic here that according to research, um, when many cases were thrown out, or people were exonerated from this innocence project using DNA evidence, they looked back at those cases to see, well, what kind of evidence actually put them away to begin with? Well, the leading cause was eyewitness misidentification, okay? Sometimes it's a false confession, sometimes it's mistaken forensic evidence, right? But the overwhelming majority of the cases of people wrongfully imprisoned have to do with faulty eyewitnesses, okay? And so, Elizabeth Loftus is the pioneer of what's called the misinformation effect, okay? In other words, she was able to do experiments on college students, okay, harmless ones, all right, just to demonstrate how memory works, and she's found that um, false memories can actually be created in people, okay? All right, so here's a simple example of one of her classic studies. I'll try to be as brief as possible. But students were asked to watch a video clip of a car accident. Okay? And then after watching that video clip, and everyone watched the same video clip, right? But they were asked different questions. So remember the, how an experiment works, right? There's an independent variable. So the different groups would get different keywords that sound different. So for example, how fast were the cars going when they... And then each group got a different adjective. Smashed, collided, bumped, hit, contacted one another, right? Now your common sense might tell you that, well, if they all saw the same video, then their estimates of speed of those vehicles should be roughly the same, you know, in the same ballpark. How you ask the question should not matter. So nowadays you may think that, right? But back then, this was revolutionary information, okay? So those who heard the word smashed had a significantly higher estimate of speed then the quest, those who read the question that included the word contacted or hit, right? And those who heard or had the word smashed in the question had a, also had a false memory of seeing glass on the ground in the video when there was no glass on the ground, okay? So that's how, that's what the power of suggestion is, okay? Is that we piece together our memories based on our perception, but also indirectly influenced by how the question is asked. Okay. So here you see it in graphic form that the word smashed had a greater influence on the perception of how fast the cars were going versus contacted or hit. Right? The estimate was in the 30s in terms of miles per hour. All right. Now a related subject here has to do with a very controversial topic within psychology called repressed memories, okay? And that is the idea that someone who goes to therapy somehow through the therapeutic process recovered a new memory that they had from childhood or when they were younger, a trauma such as being sexually or, or physically abused that they just never had a memory of, right? Well, is it possible that that's true, right? So there are, there's anecdotal evidence of people who have, you know, been convicted and tried and all that uh, for abusing someone based on these 
memories, but a researcher like Elizabeth Loftus um, would be very critical of this because the process of counseling and therapy may input or create the power of suggestion because the topic, what if the topic of abuse came up? And suddenly the person's thinking, well, if I'm this way now, maybe because someone did abuse me, right? And so um, it's possible that some of those might be false memories, okay? So there's, there's no clear-cut answer of this. There seems to be evidence pointing in both directions. All right, moving on to the next topic. Sometimes we forget things because we actually never remembered them in the first place, okay? And this is called encoding failure. And this happens when we are exposed to things every day, but we actually never paid a lot of attention to certain details. And we kind of assume that we know what things look like. And these could be everyday things you find in someone's home. It could be in your home, you know. Um, I used to do this demonstration in the classroom. When I get to this point, I tell all my students to look at the ceiling, you know. Stare at the ceiling and tell me what color the floor is, right? And they started giggling because you know why? They're, they go to that classroom twice a week, three times a week, for weeks. And very few of them got the color right of what the tiles look like on the ground, <laughs> on the floor. So they would look down and go, oh crap, it's bluish, <laughs> right? You know, that kind of thing. And the, a textbook example of that is, you know, the details of a coin or a dollar bill, okay? And I think the one I used in my lectures was, um, and you can do this at home, okay? Think about what's the primary image in the center on the back of a one dollar bill, okay? And you might be thinking, oh, it's some sort of pyramid or whatever, okay, whatever that thing you think it is, then find a dollar bill and you might be surprised. Okay, I'm not gonna tell you what that is, but let's just say you might be surprised by that. So do that at home, all right? Uh, don't rob someone just to get a dollar bill, though. All right, now let's go over a few types of memory errors. And, and these really have to do with occurrences that interfere with our memory, okay? Um, the researcher named Schachter, Schachter, he talks about how there are seven different ways that our memories could be interfered with, right? One could just be called transients. A transient experiment means that um, just remembering something more, it becomes more and more difficult because of time. And that falls under the storage decay theory of memory. That if you lose, you don't use it, you lose it kind of idea, right? So language kind of falls into that, right? You don't use it, and you kind of forget certain things. Or how to play a musical instrument. Now, there's also absent-mindedness, okay? This is forgetting caused by not paying attention. That could be called encoding failure, actually, right? So we forget things, not because they're in our mind, but they never made it to long-term memory, right? So that's the same thing with the dollar bill. We kind of know the existence of a dollar bill. That's in our long-term memory. But the details of what's on the dollar bill, even though we handle it a lot, may not be in our memory, okay? Uh, let me skip over a few of these. Um, one example is suggestibility. We just talked about that with false memories. Here's a good one, misattribution. This is where we confuse the source of a piece of information, okay? Like you thought you heard it from a friend, but actually you watched it on a video, right? And this, this is very dangerous in our time of online information, right? And the amount of misinformation is out there is that when someone is out there promoting false information about whatever subject, it could be politics or whatever it is, right? And at first glance, you recognize that as being, oh, that's ridiculous, that's got to be false. But over time, you may realize that that could be true or factual if you forget the source, right? So if you're exposed to a lot of information from reliable sources, then you're exposed to a lot of information from unreliable sources. And at the time of this recording, there's a lot of research about social media and how false information is spread much faster and wider than truthful information. So all it takes is someone to look at a meme, 
right, an image and some words on it, maybe about a politician. And even though you kind of laugh at that and say, oh, okay, that's sort of stupid, okay? And then a week later, you kind of integrate that as being a factual piece of information because you forgot the source of that information, okay? All right, let's look at us some more examples. Um, let me skip over this. All right, sometimes our memories can be distorted based on our emotions and our view of the world, right? So if we have any kind of stereotypes about people, that can interfere with our recall about people, okay? Um, a lot of times we have stereotypes about African Americans because of their names, certain types of names, and or that they're associated with being in the particular activities, like being a professional basketball player. Um, so in, ex in laboratory experiments, people would, because they, they may not clearly remember each name in each profession, they would falsely associate white people's names with a political figure and associate an African-American sounding name with being a professional athlete, okay? Um, all right, so that's an example of bias. Now, bias can interfere with our memory. All right, now persistence, and this is uh, one of the seven listed by Schachter. This is where an unwanted memory actually just floods your brain at the moment, okay? And this is part of post-traumatic stress where someone has a, a recall of something or a nightmare about it. And people who suffer from trauma may have this kind of interference. Okay, uh, let me talk uh, for a couple minutes about two types of interference with regards to memory, okay? And these two sound very similar, so you're gonna have to diagram this out so it makes sense to you. Proactive interference, okay, is where your older memory interferes with the recall of a newer memory. So you're asked for your new gym locker combination, you're trying to remember it, but all you can think about is the old gym locker, okay, combination. So proactive interference is having trouble remembering something newer, proactive, okay? Um, pro as in like the future, okay, newer. Now you think about instances where you're with a person you're dating maybe, okay? And all of a sudden the person mistakenly calls you by the wrong name and that name happens to be their ex, you see that? It's not as if they don't know who your name, okay? But temporarily, they had an interference. Or maybe that parking spot in their mind where a name of someone they're with, right? The older name popped in that spot instead of your name. And that could be quite embarrassing. So if you ever commit this social embarrassment by calling someone the wrong name, you better quickly flip to this chapter and show them, sorry, honey, this was a proactive interference. You know, it's, it's not really my fault. It, it happens a lot to people. You know, it's just temporary. It's just like a brain fart, okay? <laughs> All right. But if you choose to go to the personality chapter and use Sigmund Freud as your excuse, then you're in deep water, okay? Because Freud believes that those kinds of slips, saying someone else's name, means that you deep down unconsciously were thinking about that other person. So for you, don't go to Freud. Go to this chapter, all right? Now, the other type of interference is retroactive, right? So retroactive means that you're trying to recall something older, right? But the newer information gets in the way, okay? And this has to do with um, not just email accounts, but when I was in college, I moved almost every other semester, right? When you're living somewhere, you kind of take for granted that, oh, I, I know this address. And I remember my mom at the time, this is way back, like 20 years ago, my mom said, you really should, 20, 30 years ago, sorry, write down all these addresses you had because you never know when you might need to fill out forms and they ask, you know, the addresses for the past five years. And I laughed at my mom and said, how can I forget where I live, you know? But you know, by the time I moved for the third time, I swear I, I really could not remember my first address in college at the apartment and then I moved
for the fourth time, then I suddenly can't remember the second address. Even though it's something I see every day in my mail, it's on my check, in my checkbook, you know, back in the days when we used checks. Okay. And so that's really a bizarre thing. So my you know, the lesson here is don't laugh at your mom. She's always right. Okay. So that's an example of retroactive interference where the new information seems to almost put a stamp over an older piece of information. Okay, so think retro. Having trouble, retro means older, right? So having trouble recalling older pieces of information. It's almost as if the new information is parked on top of the old information. Okay, and that's a type of memory interference. All right, so let's talk about ways, we're almost done. Let's talk about ways to improve our memory. Okay, so we talked about rehearsal that is consciously repeating a piece of information over and over. And the reason I said earlier that that's not the best technique, because that's just keeping a piece mm -hmm. of information in your, in your short-term memory. You know, um, it, it's like replaying 10 seconds of a video on YouTube over and over again, replay, 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 right? Unless you actually do something with that information, I cannot just say a person's name 10 times and remember it. I have to actively do something with it. Whether it's to visualize the name, associate it with their appearance, okay? Um, create a nickname that goes along with the name, right? Like my, one of my old professors' name was Bob, right? Yeah, okay, a simple enough name, but the way I remembered it was that, you know, he had a receding hairline, so in my mind I was thinking Bald Bob, okay? No, I'm sorry, that might be kind of rude, but that was my memory tool to help me remember. Now, chunking, okay, chunking is what we said earlier about the numbers, right? Is grouping information into manageable chunks, and that helps us to reduce the, the amount of space used in our short-term memory so we don't feel like we're overwhelmed with the information with the seven bits, right? By organizing them into chunks. So that's like grouping numbers, right? That's one way of doing it. Then elaborate, so earlier we talked about rehearsal, just repeating something over and over again. Elaborative rehearsal is where, yes, you're repeating some information, but you're actually doing something with it, okay? Something deeper. Um, maybe relating information to old information that you know. You're learning about psychology, but you're trying to relate it and how it's different from sociology. So, and also when you're a student and you're listening to a lecture, all you need to do really and if you're watching this video, is if I mention a concept or an idea, if you just click pause and just thought about it for a second, not to repeat in your head, but just say, huh, seven bits plus or minus two, is that true? All you had to do was do that extra step to think about. That's called elaborative rehearsal, and chances are by tomorrow you'll still remember that our short-term memory capacity is seven bits of information, plus or minus two, and then it lasts for 20 seconds. Just by asking how can that be, right, is more effective than someone who listened to that part of my lecture and did not repeat it in some way or think about it in some way, right? Um, you know, what's interesting is that newer research is finding that taking notes by hand, by pen or pencil in a notebook, improves memory recall compared to typing it, right? Because if you think about what's happening, when someone's typing on their laptop in a classroom, you're just going through the action. You're just being a uh, like a courtroom recorder. You're just recording words by typing them out. You're usually not thinking about them. But someone who is using a pencil and writing notes you cannot write every single word down, right? You can't write as fast as you can type. So you're thinking about how to condense it, how to paraphrase it, and any of those skills is aiding your encoding of information. So even though you may hate writing compared to typing, and my daughter actually is very good at taking notes the old fashioned way. Even on an iPad, she uses the pencil and writes it out. It aids in recall compared to, right Emma? <laughs> She's walking by. <laughs> okay, compared to using a computer and using typing. All right, so this is our last page. How to study effectively. So some of this we just talked about. So, um, and so it's a good review right here. 
So to use elaborative rehearsal, we just talked about that by making information meaningful. Uh, apply the information to you. Okay, why is it important to me? That's the self-reference effect, right? Um, and I think whenever you take a class, it's a good question to ask when you're studying something you don't normally care about, like history or government, that might be boring for an 18-year-old. Think about, what does this have to do with me, right? You can ask the instructor that. What does this have to do with me? I don't, don't, I make it sound nice, okay? And they will try to relate it. And once you're able to do that, you will remember that piece of information, right? Be aware of interference, so try to study without too many distractions. Remember about sensory memory, right? So remember back when you were able to be in a crowded place, right? Lots of people talking at the same time, but yet you only recall certain conversations or certain people's names. That's because you use your attention, you use your sensory memory to hone in on someone's voice, right? So when you're studying, you have to reduce the amount of interference so that you can actually focus on someone who's speaking or a video you're watching, okay? And this is an interesting tip. Exercise, right? Physical movement actually helps the brain, okay? So it keeps your neurons happy. Uh, this is something we talked about in the last lecture. Get enough sleep, right? Because sleeping actually is regenerative. It helps actually consolidate a lot of the memories from the day. And here's another study tip, too. Uh, in addition to using mnemonic devices, right, little memory tools, is, and this is something I've heard over and over again, is that after a day of studying, right, and you're writing notes during the day, let's say you, you cover three classes in one day, okay, and you're kind of tired, but in that evening, look over your notes, do some highlighting, do some thinking, clarify certain things, write down some more examples, do some circling and doodling, okay? So that day's new information is more, more likely to be encoded if you look at it again that same day. Have you ever taken notes and not look at it for a week? And then you open up your, let's say they're handwritten notes or even typed, and you're wondering who wrote this, right? And let alone making sense of handwriting that's messy, but trying to make sense of what you meant at that time. So if hand handwritten notes is just a memory tool a lot of students don't even think about it. I didn't think about it. it was just something everybody did you buy your notebooks you get a pencil and you go to class but what is note-taking note-taking is a memory device it's to help you remember something long term okay okay I think that's enough for today now that you have all the information about memory I think it's time for you guys to hit the books Talk to you guys soon.